Hi. Hi, I'm Pippa Career, I'm political editor of The Mirror, and I'm delighted to be chairing this event, which I think is uh, on, on probably the issue that I am most worried about in British politics at the moment. Um, we all talk about Brexit, we talk about regional equality, um, and uh, my big fear is that we are seeing it go through a time where there is such political um, polarisation that uh, it's going to be very, very hard and take a very long time to bring people back together. Um, fortunately, uh, UK and Changing Europe have produced this pamphlet, which will hopefully give us a... No, they haven't. Policy Institute. Policy Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just really looking at the UK. <laughs> I do <Good> apologise. <laughs> <laughs> the Policy Institute has produced this brilliant pamphlet, which I'm certainly going to take away and read from cover to cover. Good. Um, Good. <laughs> make sure I get the authors right. Um, and uh, so that should hopefully, along with our panel today, help us provide some answers. So I can just very quickly introduce you um, to our panel. Um, uh, I'd better start with Anand Verde. <laughs> Over we've got Anand Menon, who is the director of um, UK and Changing Europe. Awesome. Sorry that he got <laughs> sorry that he got the credit for the report. Um, Lisa and Andy, many of you know, is the MP for Wigan. She's done a lot of work on um, towns and focusing on regional inequality and um, I've heard her speak often on this subject and she's, she's great in it. Um, and uh, we also have uh, um, Sarah Hobbelt, who's uh, Vice Chair, let me get this one right. So she's Professor in the Department of Government and European Institute at LSC and Vice Chair of the European Chair. Education Studies Chair. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't want to be demoted this yeah. early. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to demote you. Um, and of course, um, Professor Bobby Duffy, who um, is the Professor mm -hmm. of Public Policy and Director of the Policy Institute, <coughs> the man behind all of this. So, um, uh, I'm going to, first of all, um, we'll ask each of, the, each of the panelists to make a few remarks, and then we all have a chance to open up questions for you because obviously I'm sure you have lots of things that you want to, you want to come to them on. So Bobby, if I can ask you Sorry. to start off. Thank you, thank you very much. Great to see so many uh, people here for uh, this. So uh, I'm going to draw, as Pip said, I'm going to draw on this report, uh, which we, call, we published a couple of weeks ago, which we call Divided Britain uh, question mark. And the, the question mark is there deliberately. Um, it's mainly driven by an uneasiness that we felt about how quickly and completely the assumptions that were more polarised than ever uh, were being accepted. So just about all speeches, political speeches, lots of media commentary, just assumes that we've now split into these two monolithic blocks. And you're, you're actually starting to see uh, the, lang the US language of <coughs> culture wars make it into um, the UK, just being imported wholesale, even though the context is uh, very different. Um, of course, we are. It's not difficult to find evidence of how divided we are. We got a Brexit vote, uh, divisions in the Commons, even English and Scottish judges disagreeing uh, with each other. Lots, not hard to find examples of division. But the guess the main thing that we're trying to make is that we're not split into two monolithic groups around Brexit, which it can seem like from the discussion. Uh, it's really dangerous to get that uh, that uh, definition wrong. Really dangerous to get that. Uh, characterization of how the country is wrong, because we'll end up looking at the wrong things and then doing uh, the wrong things. So there's very, five, five very quick elements to this. Uh, the first point is definitional, um, and it's kind of, we tried to go through the proper definitions in a fairly academic way of what polarization is, and I won't bore you with all of those types of issues, although they are in there if you want to look them up. The main distinction is uh, a distinction between effective or emotional polarization on the one hand, and then issue polarisation on the other hand. So effective polarisation is the extent to which uh, you identify with one group and then denigrate the outgroup, the other group. So that's, um, that's the, the kind of emotional reaction to that. And then on that, there is strong evidence of an effective polarisation around Brexit. Um, we've seen this uh, on identity measures. Uh, things like 44% of people now say they, uh, their Brexit identity is very strong, whether they're leave or remain, 44% of people will say that that's very strong, compared to only 9% saying that their party ID identification is very strong. And that's a huge change. In the 1960s, it was around 40-50% of people identifying with their party, and that's collapsed over the, the past few decades. Instead, we've got this very, very strong uh, Brexit identity. But there's many more factors than that. 
uh, in terms of how we see the other side. So lots of great work by Sarah uh, uh, on uh, how we see our own side as intelligent, open-minded, honest, and the other side is selfish, hypocritical, and closed-minded. Um, that has kind of really grown around this uh, Brexit identity. It's only a minority now that say they're happy if their kids marry the other side uh, around the Brexit <laughs> identities. Uh, same with party identity, in fact, even stronger uh, relationship there. And only half, only around half are even happy to talk to the other side. And this has happened really quite quickly. Um, uh, it, not the factors underlying it, we're not saying that this has caused, been caused, this is Brexit has revealed and reinforced some underlying identity divisions that we've got. So that's kind of point one. There's the, is effective uh, definition, uh, effective polarisation is happening. But the real benefit of making that split is not kind of academic wonkery. It is, uh, when you get, have those two definitions in mind, uh, <coughs> what can happen is you can have an effective polarisation, division between people, without actually being that far apart on the issues. Um, you can dislike the other side, but not actually disagree with them on substantive things uh, very often. And there is much less evidence that we've got a really strong issue polarisation in Britain that we're miles apart on loads and loads of issues. On many domestic issues, there's much, much more common ground uh, than is often portrayed uh, in terms of the NHS, in terms of uh, what we do about climate. There's lots and lots of common ground across the group with, with the, the bulk in the middle. Even trust in other people, despite this context, we've got these long-term trends in trust uh, and we're at the highest level we've ever measured in terms of trust in other people, which doesn't really fit with this narrative of uh, extreme um, division. Even on contentious issues like immigration, uh, we're not nearly as far apart as uh, many people think, and kind of attitudes have come together, more positive views of immigration than we've seen in the past, more common ground, more people in the middle that are balancing different uh, types of views. Even on Brexit, where there is a difference in views, people miss in lot the commentary that uh, people hold multiple views, and people are much more open to compromise uh, than people uh, think. The bulk of people in the middle, uh, not the people that uh, draw the attention at either end. Um, which leads on to the third point, which is that Brexit attachments are not coherent or consistent, and there is uh, an identity, strong identity around it. When you look at what people want from that, it's not consistent within the Remain or the Leave blocks, so as we kind of know, but it doesn't come across. So one, for example, one third of Leave supporters think we should open ourselves up to the world, very kind of free uh, market buccaneering uh, 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 approach to it, but one third of Leave supporters think we should hunker down and protect ourselves uh, from the rest of the world. People, uh, and the other third are, are somewhere in the middle. So people have very different visions of what this identity means in terms of what we actually want. Uh, Remain supported, same sort of thing. Only half say they have a strong attachment to Europe, uh, an emotional attachment to Europe. Uh, the, the other half have a much more pragmatic, instr instrumental view of staying, why, why do we want to do that? And that again, that doesn't come across in the commentary. It seems to be two uh, belief systems, two belief camps, when it's actually much more pragmatic and balanced when you look at people's attitudes. Fourth point is that despite these kind of emerging uh, identity uh, things, the older left-right attachments have not gone away. Um, still very important and prominent on economic issues in particular. So, for example, nearly 9 in 10 Labour supporters believe that the economy is rigged in favour of the rich and powerful, compared with under half of Conservative supporters, regardless of whether they are leave or remain. <coughs> Uh, but on other, issue, other issues, things like immigration, whether immigration takes jobs uh, from uh, uh, native-born Britons, uh, Conservative and Leave voters, uh, Conservative and Labour Leave voters are much closer together than they are to the Remain voters in their party. So those kind of more cultural concerns cut across party divides. And then there's a third group of issues uh, on things like what type of society we want, uh, one focused on individuals or one focused on the collective. And that kind of runs a, a almost completely linear spectrum from uh, conservative leavers through to Labour remainers. Very different kind of views across that kind of spectrum. Which leads to the fifth and, and final point we make in the book. All this adds up to what we would call fragmentation, not polarisation. This is not uh, uh, two monolithic blocks. There's this famous American chart uh, by Pew Research Centre, which you might have seen, which has got... Republicans and Democrats and their kind of average political position over the years. And usually they were pretty close together for, for decades. So there was a difference, but there was a lot of overlap between them. So it was kind of 
Uh, it was about two thirds of Democrats were more uh, Democratic leaning than Republicans, and now they drifted apart like this. So there's barely any overlap between Republicans and Democrats supporters. And they call it the moving mountains chart because it does look like these two massive moving mountains uh, just moving apart, drifting apart. And that's not really uh, what we have. We have much more of a shattered landscape uh, with lots of lumps. And we need to come up with a better term than lumps. Anyone's <laughs> 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 got a fair idea of lumps, but so far that's as far as we've got. We've got a kind of uh, broken landscape, lots and lots of bits, not a simple two way split. Even a, even a simple, which for lots of political scientists in will know, a simple four way split, a quadrant split of left right with liberal authoritarian going up and down. Even that doesn't capture the complexity of what we have now. So, final uh, summing up for me is that's what the political system is straining to capture, this new map. The uh, political system is not set up for this new map. Uh, the Brexit identity is pulling the party system uh, towards it. Um, and then, uh, God knows what happens next. Um, we have to keep revising this report over the summer. It was supposed to come out before the summer, and we have to keep uh, re -write, rewriting it. Um, so from the context of this conference, uh, the conclusion of this, I guess the final point that we make in this, is where Labour goes next is crucial to how these two things align. Thank you. Yeah, it was meant to be Lisa next, but she just leant over and said, can you go next? I'm not ready. Let me also underline the fact that I'm doing this, despite the fact that when I first saw Lisa this morning, she looked at me and said, you look like shit, you've gone white. <laughs> so, this is very big of me. Uh, just a few sort of... Uh, yeah, I'll do it, yeah. It's a bug. Uh, just a few sort of thoughts, really. Nothing particularly coherent. Firstly, the worrying nature of emergent... Brexit bimodality, I suppose, where one of the strangest and most troubling things about the Brexit process for me has been how both extremes have systematically set about destroying the middle. Uh, that's as true on the referendum side as it is on the no deal side. We've seen it amongst public opinion, we've seen it in parliaments as well. Uh, just one figure from the annual, we do an annual survey of MPs and their views on Brexit. So in 2016, 26 MPs said being in the single market would be incompatible with, re with respecting the outcome of the referendum. Uh, by 2018, that number had gone up to 58%. So that's what I mean by bimodality, bi is that we're ending up with two lumps on the ends of the Brexit spectrum, which makes it very, very difficult indeed to have any kind of conversation. That doesn't mean, and it always annoys me to hear people say, you know, the British Parliament isn't working. In, in one sense, of, I mean, the British Parliament is... Polarised, divided, angry, and fundamentally a little bit clueless about Brexit. But in that sense, they perfectly represent the British. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and it's, it's, it's interesting to speculate, and it would be a lovely thing for a doctoral student to do over the next few years. If you live in a polarised and divided society, is the best way to deal with it the way we're dealing with it, which is to have that out there in the open in your parliament day after day, or essentially to pretend it's not there, which is kind of what the French political system has done. If you think about the last French presidential election, I think 42% of people voted either Mélenchon or Le Pen. So, in terms of public opinion, <laughs> French society is every bit as polarised as British society, but they have a set of political institutions, in a sense, that cover up that division rather than exposing it brutally as we do. And what I don't know is 10 years hence, which approach to the question of polarisation proves most effective, if either one does, uh, overcoming it. But that's something probably for another day and another conference. The danger of this division in our politics for me is firstly that if the Brexit divide becomes the defining division in our politics, and it hasn't become so yet, and let's not overstate it, the left-right divide is still fundamental and the most important driver of voting in 2017, but if it did, it will make governing very, very difficult indeed, because the sort of cross-class alliances that you see in the Brexit divide are almost impossible to devise economic policies for. For this particular party, obviously, if Brexit becomes a structuring divide of politics, the future won't be great because that divide goes straight through the heart of the party. So I think, in a sense, what Labour is doing and what Labour should be doing, just to sort of take it where Bobby left off, is in a sense gambling on the strength of traditional politics. 
And there is data there that shows that actually there are grounds to be hopeful on this, this score. Paula Surridge from the University of Bristol has done some fantastic work on this. And what her work shows, a couple of things worth noting. One, people who voted Labour in 2017 display enormous amounts of antipathy to the very notion of voting Conservative, regardless of where they lie on the Leave Remain spectrum. So it's not that easy to shift from political tribe to the opposing political tribe, whatever your Brexit preference. So, for instance, even the strongest leavers amongst those people who in 2017 voted Labour, only 12% of them see themselves as more than 6 out of 10 likely to consider voting Conservative at the next election. So the problem isn't Labour might, if they don't tack towards Leave, lose votes to Conservatives. The problems lie on the fringes. And in a sense, the next election, to an extent, is going to be about which of the big parties can avoid losing votes to the Lib Dems and the Brexit party, rather than which of them can avoid losing votes to each other. And for me, actually, the key for Labour and the key for Labour's position is to ensure that the next election is not a Brexit referendum yeah. uh, election. Yeah. Uh, keeping a strong focus on the issues, uh, which is why, in a sense, this conference has started off so appallingly badly. Uh, you know, there are a lot of very big policy announcements being made, really big policy announcements being made. You think about the stuff on private schools, you think about the stuff on social care, but it's being drowned out by this fighting over Brexit, which is exactly where the party doesn't need to be. So trying to split the difference is a weird strategy. We spent an hour in conversation with Barry Gardner last night, and the full weirdness was revealed in <laughs> glorious technicolour. But it's a strange policy on many levels, but politically, actually, I think it might well be a sensible one to be that party that sticks to the middle ground. But let me end on a cautionary note. Whilst I think Labour's Brexit policy is a sensible electoral strategy, it is a catastrophic governing strategy. That is to say, it's all very well using this strategy to get you into power, but if you implement it in power, there are dangers ahead. I mean, I've just watched in the last couple of days the Cameron News, and I was reminded, I'm not quite sure how I forgot, but I was reminded of just how brutal that fight inside the Conservative Party was when you have a government that calls a referendum and leaves itself open to attack by its own side. That is not a good look to a government. And Labour's current position seems to be that Jeremy Corbyn will go to Brussels and negotiate a deal, and then if the Labour Party want to trash the deal that he's negotiated, that's up to them in the ensuing referendum campaign. As I said, that might make sense to be saying it now. I hope to God the party don't do it once they're in power, because I think then that will diminish the amount of time they end up spending in power, because it could tear the government apart. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Lots to think about there, particularly to some of the votes that are coming up this afternoon. Um, Sarah, can we come to you next? Well, I mean, I agree with, with a lot of what's been said, but let me make it a bit more interesting focus on, on, on some of the points where I uh, disagree. So, I mean, I think we all agree that there, is, that there are these Brexit identities that have grown and right now are more politically salient to voters than their left-right identities, although they might be mobilized again in a general election campaign. I mean, what we've heard is that around 80% of people now see themselves and are willing to identify as leavers or remainers. And that this really goes beyond politics in that it's a sort of the effect of polarisation that Bobby talked about is really a kind of a, an active dislike and an antagonism of the other side. And while Bobby, of course, is right to say that that doesn't mean there's not policy agreement, what I think that statement overlooks is the fact that these effects of polarisation, once there's leadership on the other side, people will take cues for these lead, from these leaders in terms of how they look at policy. So even though we might start off not disagreeing on, on issues that are not about Brexit, but just about Brexit, it will spill over because we belong to these tribes, just as partisan attachments do. So in other words, if I'm a strong, firm and remainer, once Boris Johnson comes out with something that I might traditionally have thought, oh, you know, that's quite sensible, I'll think, well, he does not belong to my tribe. I will disagree with it because it is the policy of Boris Johnson. Just like now, a lot of Labour supporters will disagree with things because it's a Conservative. So we can't just think, oh, because if we now ask people a range of policy issues, uh, where leavers and remainers, in fact, agree, that means they will always. There are these divisions spill over into other kinds of divisions as well. And these are really strongly held things. I mean, 
we have the research that I have done with, with others has shown that people are willing to sort of discriminate people that they feel belong to the other tribe and so on. So I think it should worry us even if we can find some agreement on policy. And uh, also, in fact, there are also a growing sense of that we have an idea of what the other side believes in. So we've done a, 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 some research where we ask people, what do you think levers, people supporting lever, Brexiteers would think of that policy? And people are remarkably accurate in how they can, uh, how they can sort of see policy agreement in these groups. So for example, these are issues that have not to do with the EU, because there is this sort of, you know, you said we don't want to use the words culture wars, I agree, you know, anything with wars, and there's too much of that in, in British media at the moment. But certainly there is a sort of cultural dimension that, for example, death penalty is one of the things that's most, attitudes towards that is most highly correlated with how you voted and how you identify in Brexit. Now that's not an EU issue, but it's clearly a kind of cultural policy issue where there is a, a deep division in what to think. So leavers are overwhelmingly likely to support death penalty and remainers the other way around. So, and there's a number of issues like that, foreign aid, immigration, and so on. So there are, there's more to Brexit, the Brexit division than just Brexit. And, and it is more intensely felt now than we can just say, oh, you know, once we leave it will all go away, I fear. Um, now, that also, um, I think, affects the, the policy positions, the way in which the policy position of the Labour Party is perceived. And here's where I'm going to <coughs> disagree a bit with Anand, although I don't like to disagree with him because he's, you know, normally always right. Uh, <laughs> but, but the thing is, you know, the Labour Labour Party supporters are not really very divided, actually. I mean, it's just not to the same extent as, for example, even Conservative supporters. You know, even of the 2017 Labour voters, only 18% of them identify as Leavers. That doesn't mean that these are not important, 18%. And the same thing if you ask um, whether or not the decision was right or wrong, you get the same kind of figures. Of course, of current Labour supporters, it's even lower. Only 8% of current Labour supporters uh, think it was right for Britain to vote to leave the European Union. Now, uh, I can see the sort of logical argument for saying, well, we had a vote, so we should stay in the middle and, and not uh, take a position. But the problem is, once you have effective polarization, then people want to know which side you're on in a sort of much more intuitive sense. They want to know which team are you playing for. You know, I mean, Anand follows football. He will know he doesn't want to, oh, I'm just watching it for the beautiful, beauty of the game. No, he wants someone who's on his side. That is the emotive aspect of effective polarization. And right now, voters don't know which side Jeremy Corbyn is on. I mean, that is what all the polling shows. And um, in fact, uh, if you look at who trusts Jeremy Corbyn to make the right decision of Brexit, half of people who are currently supporting uh, Labour thinks that. But only 27% of the people who voted for Labour in 2017 thinks that Jeremy Corbyn would make the right decision on Labour. And of course, this is very different for the Conservative Party, where people, where the Leavers have clearly rallied behind Boris Johnson and know where he stands. So I think there is a danger in sort of saying, oh, we're going to be all, all things to all people in, in a political uh, world where people want sort of clarity and understand that someone is batting for their team. Um, and that also said only 37% of Labour Party supporters think that the Brexit policy, whether or not they agree with it or not, the party's Brexit policy is clear. People simply do not know. Uh, and I fear that even in a couple of days, when this, all these motions have been voted on and so on, people are still not going to know. And to be frank, I mean, even for all of us who study these things, and it's a bit hard to get your head around. So I think there is an argument to be said that maybe having a clearer position would still give voters the choice of which day they want to vote, but where people know, well, you, act, you have a policy on the most important issue of the day would be something that would be more attractive to voters, certainly the voters who are more likely to vote for Labour. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks very much.
very much everyone. And, and I, I, the reason that was scribbling away and that I told a poor hungover Alan that he had to go first was because um, yeah. I sort of changed my mind during the course of listening to all of that. And so I've had a speech and I've completely rewritten it. And uh, it says the opposite. So I am basically Labour's <laughs> dilemma right here. I've <laughs> managed to split three ways on a two way question. And I've still have to finally settled the, the question or the answer. And I, I want to start by taking you back to 2016 and that, that moment when the result came in after the referendum. I was standing in Manchester at the count. There was this sort of pre moment where the Sunderland result came in. And there was sort of ripple of shockwaves around the room. People thought, hang on a minute. It was so overwhelmingly in favour of leave that suddenly people started to think, my God, this is going to happen. And it was a moment that felt really, to me, like a political earthquake. Why? Because very few people in Westminster and Whitehall had seen it coming. Very few people in the media had understood that it was about to happen. But it happened. And actually, the surprise to me in Wigan wasn't that two-thirds of my constituents voted to leave, it was that only two-thirds of my constituents voted to leave. It felt like it had been a really long time coming, and it exposed divisions that were much, much deeper and run back much, much further than Brexit, um, that people had been trying to give voice to through our political system for quite a long time. In my town, we had years of falling turnout, and then we had this very sudden and dramatic rise in support for UKIP, and we just simply couldn't hear it. We thought that it was apathy because we couldn't hear that roar, as George Eliot puts it, that lies on the other side of silence. But in 2016, it became surely impossible to ignore. Well, you would think so, but actually, we did. And here we are, three years on, and I just have this overwhelming sense when I go home to Wigan that we have just completely and utterly missed the point of what has just happened in British politics. Because, you know, when I talked to my constituents, and I was ringing round recently, I rang when Boris Johnson kicked us all out of Parliament, I had a bit of time on my hands, so I started to, to just ring round a few constituents and a few party members as well in Wigan. People who've contacted me about other issues, not necessarily Brexit, just to find out what they think. Because I'm like every MP, my inbox is absolutely full this morning of people emailing me, telling me I'm an absolute disgrace and a traitor. I've let down this country. I've let down this country on the one hand because I'm a crazed Remainer who's trying to block Brexit, and on the other hand, because I'm a crazed Leaver who's trying to drive this country off a cliff. But actually, when you get away from all of that noise and you talk to people, I was ringing people saying, just wanted to know what you think about it, we're going to be debating policy at the conference. Nearly everybody that I spoke to said, we just need to compromise. I just want to find a way through this. Why? Because my constituency was split. A third of people voted Remain, two thirds of people voted Leave. They care about the EU, and most of all, they care about the mess that we're making of dealing with the aftermath of the referendum. But they care more about their families and their communities. My next-door neighbour shouted at me the day that I went to vote in the referendum, be proud of your country, Lisa, and I gave him quite a short response. But he still, you know, he, he wanted to leave the EU, and he still wants to leave, and he wants to see us get on with it. But he is also my next-door neighbour who puts my bins out when I'm in London, on a Wednesday and, you know, is decent and friendly to me as I am to him and to his family. And the public, I think, are better than we are. they found a way to grapple with the complexity of what's just happened and say we need to move on. Now, the majority view in Wigan, I can tell you, is that we should leave with a deal. But there is a significant and growing number of people now who are saying just cut all ties and get us out altogether. And I think we have to get serious about the need to compromise, or we may find that it's too late. But those divisions about Brexit, I think those divisions actually out there in the country, they are the sorts of things that can be overcome. But those divisions expose much, much deeper problems in this country. So when the referendum result came in, one of my friends, Will Jennings, the academic um, at Southampton University, who I set up the Centre for Towns with, along with Ian Warren, a few years ago. He sent me a, a map of Britain of how people voted. And in those big urban centres, Manchester nearby to me, people had overwhelmingly voted to remain. But outside of there, just a few short miles away in towns across the country, people had voted to leave. Why has this happened? Why have those very big divisions become, very, geographical polarisation become very evident? Well, it, you've got you've to run the clock back about 40 years and start to understand what's happened in our towns. So, 40 years ago, I was born in Manchester. Um, 
which was at the time much, much um, older in terms of population than Bury, Bolton, Wigan, all the surrounding towns. Why? Because the factories, the mills, the mines were in our towns, the jobs were there, so the young people gravitated there. But over the course of those 40 years, what we've seen is those jobs lost and those young people leaving. When the Labour government came in, there was a very, very clear plan to invest in cities in the hope that the benefits would trickle out to surrounding towns. They opened up higher education so that many young people from towns like mine, for the first time in their family history, got the chance to go to university and they grabbed it and it was amazing. But when they looked back, they found that there was nothing to return home to. And as a result, our towns have aged and our cities have grown younger, so now the Manchester that I was born into is much, much younger, much, much more socially liberal, much, much more pro-EU, um, and the Wigan that I've made my home, where my family live, is much, much older and different on every single measure. Now, we've got to grapple with this, because these are two Englands, as Will puts it, that have had completely different experiences of globalisation, and in those towns, those towns, by the way, and I accept what Sarah is saying about most <coughs> Labour supporters voted Remain, but actually those towns will be the key battleground for the next general election. They are where votes, seats are up for grabs, and in those towns where most people voted Leave, there is a real, real issue about trust in the political system. People haven't just seen jobs disappear, they've also seen the sense of purpose disappear. Within living memory, my town in Wigan, Barnsley, these were places that were at the centre of the world. We literally powered the world through dangerous, dirty, difficult work in the mines. And when those jobs disappeared, with them went the sense of purpose and the sense of identity. And we want it back. And we want back those jobs. We don't just want them back because it gives us the spending power, the working age population, the spending power that sustain our pubs and our high streets and our bus networks, the things that are the beating heart of community. We want it back because we want our young people to have real meaningful choices, not to have to choose between home and family and opportunity and work. And for those young people who choose to, we want them to be able to stay there so that older people aren't growing <coughs> old um, hundreds of miles away from children and grandchildren. The crisis of social care, the crisis of loneliness, all of these things are playing out in communities like mine right across the country. <coughs> there is a real sense that politics just shrugs its shoulders in the face of all of that and says this is progress, you either get on board or you get out of the way. But there's a challenge for Labour too because we need to win those towns. There is no route to Downing Street that doesn't run through towns like mine, like Bolton, um, like Hastings, um, right across the country. But we need to to maintain our base in the cities, where we've been, we've been making huge gains recently, but where decades of growth has been also accompanied by searing inequality, and where many, many people now feel that their liberal and internationalist values are under threat and have no home in modern Britain. And we've got to find a way to speak for these two Englands. Now, what unites them? Well, I've spent a lot of time in many of those places over the both places, both Englands, over the last few years. And what I think really does unite people now is the sense that the world is spinning out of control and <coughs> politics just doesn't have answers to the very fundamental problems that people face and an overwhelming sense of anxiety and insecurity about what the future has to offer to them and their children. The answer in towns like mine is jobs. It's, um, it's so that young people can stay, it's so that there's purpose. And by the way, this does something else. We did a, we've got a report coming out for the Centre for Towns um, in a few weeks' time. We went and spoke to young people in Wigan and Hastings to ask them what they thought about their lives, about their towns, about their futures, about why most of them were planning to leave the places that they'd been born and brought up uh, and what would convince them to stay. And they talk very, very strongly about their attachment to home and to place. They are strongly conservative, socially conservative in terms of those values, about how important place and community is to them about how important that sense of local identity is too. But they're also very, very socially liberal. They're strongly feminist. They believe in diversity, equality, LGBT rights. Uh, they hate racism. They're pro-immigration. They want to see climate change tackled. Now, this is important. Why? Because we haven't just grown apart and become geographically polarised 
on Brexit, it's on a whole host of social issues. And this is one of the reasons why you've seen in recent years Labour tearing itself apart about things like immigration, trying to speak for both. Because you have people who live in one place and people who live in another that, with very, very different attitudes and never meet. And we're losing the ability to understand one another. Well, I've seen it in my town, what happens when young people take the lead. And a few years ago, we set up, they set up, with support from me and others, but they did it, uh, the first Pride March in Wigan. And there was a protest. We had some church groups coming out to protest. There was a real backlash about it from some people locally. And over the course of those five years, those young people have persisted, and they have changed things. So a few weeks ago, the whole town came out to support our fifth Pride rally, and it is changing attitudes, and it's changing the nature of the debate. So this really matters to Britain if we want to start bringing people back together. But why aren't we doing it? Well, I'll tell you why we aren't doing it. It's because decisions in this country are made hundreds of miles away from where people live, by people who have absolutely no skin in the game and no idea about the impact that those decisions make on people's lives. Recently, I had a train route cancelled from Wigan to Manchester Piccadilly that most of my constituents rely on every day to get to work. One stroke of a pen in Whitehall cancelled out people's chances to see their grandchildren, people's chances to take up apprenticeships, people's chances to get home on time to read their children a bedtime story. These things really, really matter. So we have to move power. Why? Because how can it be that the Arts Council spends £8 in Islington for every £1 that they spend across all the former coalfield communities of Great Britain? Three quarters of the closures of libraries, theatres, uh, museums, between 2010 and 2017 happened in our towns. This isn't just people being cut adrift from arts and culture. This is people, their lives, their communities, our identities, being cut out of our national story altogether. And I tell you, when we set up Centre for Towns, we went to, to many towns to ask people what they wanted to talk about. We thought it was going to be Brexit. It was buses. The next election will be more about buses and less about Brexit. The second thing that they told us in every town we went to was about arts and culture. I hadn't understood it, I hadn't realised, but especially in working class communities like mine, art and culture has always been a rich and important part of the socialist heritage. And we are, we are letting people down because this is not at the top of our agenda. What I'm trying to get at is that you have to give people a stake in this country. And it's why I really support Jeremy when he says you can no more wish away the 17 and a half million people who voted to leave than the 16 million people who voted to remain. But you can't wish away these two Englands. You have to think seriously about how you give people a stake in their country. And I'll just finally say this, is that politics is a mess at the moment. It is a complete battleground. And it seems that we find ways, endless ways, multiple ways, to divide ourselves against each other. But there's something that is a really real unifying force in Britain at the moment, and that's place where people come from, their identity, their community. And in those places, great things are happening and people are coming together and that decent, sensible, pragmatic majority is finding a voice. And as Andy Burner put it the other day, can you think of any other idea out there at the moment that unites people across the political spectrum? And that's why I say that for all the agony about Brexit at this conference this week, Labour has to get serious about power where power lies and giving power away. This should be the theme and the mission and the purpose of the next Labour government because in the end, <coughs> our best hope is each other. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you to the panel for this very thought-provoking um, contributions. Now, we've got some time to have some questions, so what I'm going to do is if you put your hands up, you're to ask one, and I'll get three questions at a time. Um, and we've got a rooming mic somewhere. Yes, a rooming mic in the middle there. Um, and if I could ask you, please um, ask you to, to ask a question after make a statement. Um, and I'm going to give you a policy and cut you off if you want to try and make a speech. Sorry. <coughs> time. Okay, so if we start with the lady here, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, Sam Butters, I'm Chief Executive of the Fair Education Alliance. Um, so my question is around Lisa's point about the um, kind of 
first doing families to go to university, leaving small towns, going off to basically the kind of um, going to the urban centres, Manchester, London, like that completely typifies my life story. Um, and I, I, I completely agree. I think when I go back to where I, um, my town and my family, I've got the kind of division between my parents and, and what I'm doing. I guess my question is, what role, um, withstanding everybody kind of going back to where they grew up, and that might be an answer, what role do you see that generation um, playing in this kind of place-based approach? Um, I do have those attachments to where I came from, um, uh, North Yorkshire, a town outside York, um, but my life and my job is everything in London now, and what role do those people have to play in, in, in this um, effort? Thanks. There's another one. Another question? Yeah. The gentleman down here in front? Somebody else will start. Thank you. Um, my question is to everybody, really, I suppose. When we talk about a unification, doesn't this party have the ideal opportunity through Jeremy Corbyn, who is actually recognised universally amongst working people as somebody as honest and as a politician that could, if only everybody could get behind him, actually de deliver the way forward? Sorry that you were what's your, what's your What's your name, sir? Yeah, my name's Dave Bacon. I'm a city councillor in Cambridge. Thank you. And there's a question on the front row as well, and then we'll come to the panel to answer them, please. Oh. There's the microphone there. Thanks, sir. Okay. Sorry, what's your name, sorry? Stephen Payne. Stephen. My question is about what do we not talk about when we talk about Brexit? I mean, is it, my impression to going around where, in London where I live is that people are just absolutely sick to death or senseless by the Brexit. And it's a preoccupation of a kind of political and social elite. Now, on that day, whenever it was, 29th of June, or 16th of June, I can't remember. But when the res referendum result happened, there was for a brief in instant, the, the, the initial response from the political system was that this was the revolt of the dispossessed. <coughs> you know, that they were last spoken. They, they delivered a verdict of what they think of modern Britain. And you know, the, even within the Conservative Party, there was some sort of attempt by May to address those concerns, yeah. which very rapidly fizzles out. Now, the debate on Brexit is continuing to the exclusion of the concerns of a lot of people who feel themselves to be dispossessed in Britain. Isn't this a bit of a racket? by the political system. Okay. Aren't the political system just refusing to address the concerns of a very great number of people in Britain? Okay, thank you. Those are two really excellent questions. Um, so I'm going to start um, with Sarah and we'll work our way back through the panel and if you each address any of the points that you think are particularly relevant to you. I'm just uh, uh, briefly um, some evidence on some of the points made. I think, um, I think it's not, I don't think there's any evidence to say that it's recognized universally that the voting people think Jeremy Corbyn is authentic and trustworthy, in the sense that also amongst working class people, uh, he does have an issue in terms of, of, of people trusting him. He does have very low ratings on trust and trust and So just to say that, that I think that is not indeed universally recognized. In terms of the question on revolt of the dispossessed, uh, I think it's interesting because on one hand, of course, that's overstating. If you look at the alliance of people who voted Brexit, indeed, there were very, very wealthy individuals and very wealthy part of Britain that also, so there was a kind of alliance. But there is growing evidence now in, in academia that, first of all, austerity policies contributed, but also the things that Lisa talked about, about regions, not necessarily the poorest regions, but regions in long-term decline or that hadn't, that hadn't done as well. Uh, as other regions over the last decades were the ones to vote more for Brexit. So clearly the, 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 the picture is more complex than just all the left behind and the poor vote, voted Brexit. Indeed, that's not what we see. The education cleavage and the age cleavage is much more difficult. But we do now see some of these, uh, some of these issues that also Lisa highlighted. So, yes. Thanks. Uh, on, on universities first, I mean, I think I've Part of the reason I went to university was to escape Wakefield. Uh, and, the, you know, and the notion of going back just never crossed my mind. I think one of the things we can do in this country is look at how the US use state universities and the incentives they give for people to stay local. That's to say, it's not necessarily always the case that you have to go loads and loads of miles from home to go to university. And for instance, you could have incentives built into the fee structure of universities that give you fee waivers if you stay in your local region. 
and go to university there. I mean, there are all sorts of ways, I think, to give people incentives to, you know, there are very good universities all around the country. Uh, and it shouldn't be beyond the wit of man to do what some of these big US public universities do, which is to try and encourage local people to stay at home to go to university so that they stay at home to work after they finish at university. Uh, but I think those are the kinds of things we need to be looking at because there's a very real issue about a brain drain and a youth drain from these areas. There's a wonderful piece by Sarah O'Connor about 18 months ago about Blackpool in the Financial Times, which I recommend to all of you, which is just a heartbreaking story about how these towns just die, essentially. Uh, on the gentleman's question, firstly, let's be careful about saying Brexit was the sort of revolt of the dispossessed. Because the majority of Brexit voters were relatively affluent Tory voters. Okay, so it's a far messier picture than that. And secondly, whilst on the one hand you're right, everyone's bored by Brexit, everyone's also obsessed by it. So if you talk to journalists, what they'll say to you is the mailbox is full of people saying, why are all the stories about Brexit? But if you put Brexit in a headline, it gets more clicks than any other story. So there's a kind of paradox about this. that was, It's a sort of fascinated horror. Uh, you know, you can't quite tear yourself away from it even though you want to. But on the substantive point, you're absolutely right. We effectively haven't been governed. For all the fine words about the dispossessed, the left behind, whatever else it might be, since June of 2016, we haven't been governed, and nothing has happened in a concrete way to address these issues. But it goes deeper than that, as Lisa was talking about, which is the problem isn't just that we haven't been governed. The problem is also that when we are governed, we tend to be governed by people with London concerns. Uh, you know, Lisa quite rightly talked a lot about buses. Politicians tend to talk about high-speed trains. That's not the issue for most people who live in the sort of towns that Lisa is talking about. So I think there are two issues. One, getting beyond Brexit so we can do politics again and be governed again. But secondly, think about how we're governed, because otherwise we go back to the old world where we're governed from London according to an agenda set by people who spend an awful lot of time in London and the rest of the country doesn't get a look in. Um, so the, on this question about young people, the, I mean, the point is not to... Um, to, to say that everybody has to move back to where they grew up, you know, I'm not going to go and live in Bury tomorrow because, you know, next Labour government will mandate people to move back to the postcode in which they were born. But it, it's about giving young people choices. And what we heard in the uh, research for the report that we're about to put out is that some of those young people really want to believe you know, young people in Hastings were saying they wanted new opportunities, they were frustrated, they felt limited, they felt they'd outgrown the place that they lived and they wanted to go and do something else. Um, but many young people said that they'd like to stay but they didn't see how it was possible. And when did it become acceptable for us to impose our choices on them? These were our choices, not theirs. You can go to university, but only if you agree to leave your friends, your family, your home, your community. And many of those young people want to come back and make a contribution to their community. So I met this amazing young woman in Bolton the other day who had gone off to university first in her family to go. She went to Cambridge, working class young person. She did maths. She became a coder. She was very in demand by top companies all over the country, all over the world. But she'd gone home to see her family and thought, my God, look at the high street, look at what's happening here. I'm really, why is this happening to my hometown? So she's moved home and she's opened up a shop on the high street, um, a coding shop. And I don't know how, but she managed to persuade the council to give it to her for free. And she's just that sort of person. And um, people can drop in and learn how to code. And they've started taking referrals from the job centre. They got 90 <coughs> applications for a 14 place course. Every single person on that course has finished the course, even though it's hard. Every single one of them has got jobs. And a lot of those jobs, it turned out, they got locally. And they got them locally because it, there, are, there are lots of companies in Bolton who need coders and can't find them in the local area. So she's done the most incredible thing because she's not only uh, given those 14 people, and the next round is coming through now, a chance at a decent career. She's filled the skills shortage in the town and she's reinvented the high street. I mean, it's quite amazing stuff. And we need to give people the opportunity to do that if that's what they choose. Um, I think this question about um, Jeremy Corbyn, I, I think this, there's an honesty about our position on Brexit. So I'm, I'm not in favour of a second referendum. I didn't vote for the first one. I'm not going to vote for a second one. I think they force people to make binary choices about something that is a quite a complex and nuanced issue. And by nature, they're divisive. I think there are better ways, like citizens' assemblies, that we can find to bring people back into the conversation and help to drive what happens next. But I think there is an honesty in acknowledging 
that this is difficult, that labour is divided, that the country is divided, that none of the options available to us, including my preferred option of leaving with a deal, none of these things come without cost now. And we've got to level with people, and I actually think the public understand that, and I think part of the frustration that you talked about with the public debate is the fact that we're just not levelling with people about it. It's no use pretending that you can just revoke and this will go away. There is no use pretending that you can leave with no deal and you won't then have to go and negotiate complex arrangements with other countries in a much more difficult way. There's just no use pretending that there, are, there aren't options that, um, without costs. And I, th I think that that will be a strength for us at the next election. I know it's confusing, you know, I've done a few media interviews this morning and people say, well, nobody's going to be able to understand this, but I actually think the public is smarter than we give people credit for. Um, and just finally on this, this issue about um, what people feel out in the country, I'm really worried about what's happening in the country because I feel actually that six months ago when we were knocking on doors in Wigan, people were angry, but now they're just saying, go away. And they don't mean it to Labour, they mean it to the political system as a whole. It used to be that people in my town, they, you know, they said bad things about the Tories when you knocked on their doors. It, it, for a while it was about politicians because of the expenses scandal, but now it's about Parliament and it's about politics. It comes up, Parliament comes up all the time on the doorstep. And I, I worry about it. Why? Because I think that the debate to most people, as you said rightly, is just completely and utterly irrelevant, the political debate. And this is a real problem because... A representative democracy is quite an unusual thing and you know how could it be that in a representative democracy we hadn't heard or understood what was happening in our communities to the point that the 2016 referendum came as an enormous shock to most people. Representatives have become completely unmoored from the people that we seek to represent and there are people on both left and right, populists now, who are using this as a moment to step in and say this liberal democratic system is not working and it's illegitimate and it needs to go. And a new version of democracy that's emerged which is about might is right and minority rights aren't protected. If 52% say something that is what happens and crush the rest. And this is a really, really dangerous moment for us as a country and I think we have to wise up and get serious about that because they say representative democracy is illegitimate and in towns like mine largely at the moment I think they're winning the argument. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Yeah, just to pick up on those that type of theme actually, the, the idea of this being a bit of a racket and it's political classes talking to each other, I think that, that's focusing specifically on Brexit, I think that there definitely is a feeling along those lines among the public. We do involve in research projects that use more deliberative events where you get people together to talk uh, through the issues, give them some evidence and some space to talk amongst each other. And you get a much different atmosphere at those types of things. And one of them recently <coughs> kind of made a pact between themselves to not talk about Brexit at all. And, and they kept that pact. Everyone was delighted not to talk about Brexit, to talk about actual issues that will improve uh, the country. So there is definitely a clickbait element to it. I get that, that people will click on those types of things. But when you get people into deeper discussions about what we want to do, uh, they can engage with each other. And I think going to Lisa's point is, that's why it's so important to emphasise what brings us together, as well as the mechanisms to bring us together, because the threat is as serious as that of uh, people breaking down the whole system because they think it doesn't work at all. But we, we have got much more to work with in terms of bringing people together than we think. And then, so final point on that is we did a session in here just before this one on the industrial strategy, which became incredibly place-based. It was all the discussion was about how do you localise this, how do you make it relevant to uh, local areas. So uh, every single element of it was about how do you tailor it to local areas because you can't have this national approach. I think that is the exciting bit here, is about how do we truly embed place-based thinking, not just into politics, but into the economy as well. And how do we get that to work for local people? Because on your point about generations, uh, the youngest generation, I'm writing a book about generational differences now, uh, what's happened to the different generations in Britain since uh, the war. And there is no way that we should be asking the younger generation who've been hardest hit in many different ways, uh, from the economy and from the types of support they have, uh, to come back and to do things that, that sacrifice their own opportunities in a sense. What we should be, we should be turning that around entirely and creating the opportunities for people to make it in their own uh, local areas. This is about creation of local opportunities, not forcing people, not pushing people to say, actually, you may have been screwed over, but we also want you to do this. So I think it's
is that more optimistic, place-based vision of the future is what we, we really need to emphasize. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions, but um, you know, we, I'm sure we could sit here for another hour and ask lots. But um, um, feel free to try and grab any of the panel if you've got something. <laughs> sorry, guys, if you've got something specific you want to ask them on the way out. But if I can, if I can thank um, Sarah, Anna, and Lisa, and of course Bobby and the Policy Institute um, for uh, for a really thought-provoking. Um, <laughs>